why would an art historian be interested in this? Well, this painting is not a portrait. We don't know who this woman was. There's no documentary evidence. And it's, it's called a trony, which is a, in this case, a character study to celebrate youth and beauty. And uh, art historians and Vermeer scholars themselves seriously debated the question of whether there was actually a woman in Vermeer's studio, or Vermeer did it from his imagination. Well, the fact that these clues agree so well almost surely shows that um, there really was a girl present. Imagine trying to get the pattern of likeness along that outer boundary to agree with this girl, doing it in your imagination. Very, very hard. So that's one aspect. Now, these techniques can be used elsewhere. Imagine five of these clues agreed really well, but the clue from the pearl differed by, oh, I don't know, 10 degrees. That might suggest that the pearl was added later or as an afterthought. And this happens uh, especially in the Renaissance, where someone will have a portrait, for instance, um, put it back on the wall and say, you know, my wife would look better with a tiara or a pearl, and then commission another artist uh, under different studio conditions, different times of year, to add something on. And there uh, might not be sort of agreement between the uh, lighting estimates. The fact that that's not the case, or in other words, that these all agree so well, almost surely shows that this was all done by Vermeer's hand, and there was never debate on that. But this technique can be used elsewhere, especially in Renaissance art, when you have a master who might have done two figures in a, a scene of, say, six figures, and an apprentice have done the others, maybe at a different time, different studio condition, different year, uh, different setup, and so forth. So just like Brad and Angelina, we can um, do the lighting analysis on these figures and see if it's the same or differs from the others. In fact, I'm at the Metropolitan Museum of Art tomorrow morning uh, working on just this on the uh, Robert Kemp Hansen Road altarpiece. Well, this painting was almost surely done with a small, uh, uh, executed when there was a small window in the north wall of Vermeer's studio, so that the light, there was no diurnal motion, the sun is not moving across the sky, anything like that. But it is a fairly small light source, and we know that also by the size of the glint on the eye and on the pearl and so forth, and the small standard deviation from the occluding contour algorithm. So that tells us something about the lighting. Uh, but there are lots and lots of paintings that have much more diffuse lighting, light fields as we call them. So even in this room, I've got light coming from here, from here, reflecting off, and so forth. Can we generalize our methods to apply to paintings executed under that kind of lighting condition? Well, the answer is yes. Here's a painting by an American artist <coughs> Garth Harris, who lives in Philadelphia, of Mayor Rendell, uh, you know, governor, I guess. Um, and it's difficult to get famous people to come into your studio and stand for a long time. So Garth works the following way. He goes out to the mayor's home, takes a photograph of him, click, and then he goes to the scene where he wants to paint him uh, against and takes another photograph. Click. There's the, paint, there's the artist standing in place with the background here. And so he then goes back into his studio and has two photographs. When he's painting the background, he's looking at one photograph. When he's painting the figure, he's looking at the other. There's no guarantee that the lighting in those two photographs is the same, or that he can see the difference and fix it in the painting. So you have to look at this and say, you know, is the lighting in the background? This is a terrible projection, by the way. But even on the actual painting, it's very difficult to tell by eye whether the lighting on the background is the same as on the figure or not. Well, let me show you how we developed very sophisticated computer methods that can tell the difference, that can see it when humans can't. Well, here is the control group for you scientists here. That, uh, here's a, a painting uh, by Herrick. It came from this photograph. He took this photograph and then nine years later executed this uh, painting. I've added these black lines. These are where we're going to analyze the light over the boy and over the, uh, uh, the mother. And we have to make some assumptions about these objects, or my methods only work if you, in certain cases, that the surfaces are Lambertian. They won't work on glass. Uh, they have to be diffused, like dry skin. They'll work fine. That it works on objects that have uniform reflectivity or albedo. My method will not work on a zebra, because that change in lightness is due to the inherent properties of the object itself. That the light sources are fairly distant, for some geometrical reasons. We can't have light coming in from funny angles and so forth. Uh, most important is that the objects are convex, because if an object's concave, 
then some of the light will strike one surface of the object and then reflect or splash, as we say, and strike the other. And that will confuse the mathematics, so to speak. So, and for the same reason, the objects must be reasonably well separated. You can't have two objects that close that the light strikes one object and then strikes the other. And those properties hold in these paintings that I'm going to be showing you. And so here's one of those objects, and we have now allow light to come from all, every possible direction. That's the illuminant L of V, V is the vector coming in. And we're going to model the brightness at a given point on the occluding contour of having a normal vector N. And what we have ended, that brightness there, is an integral over all possible directions of the intensity of the light that's coming in, and then the reflectivity for the light coming in at that angle V for that given end. So there's a certain amount coming in this direction, and then you, you add that up and so forth. Well, that gets actually somewhat complicated, so this looks more complicated, but it's actually simpler. We're going to describe that pattern of light coming in in a series. If you're familiar with Fourier series, where you can take a tone, and express it as a uh, sum of a uh, number of harmonics. The same idea uh, applies to the pattern of light coming in. It's just instead of sine waves, we use what are called spherical harmonics, a different set of basis functions. I know it's starting to sound complicated, but stay with me here. Um, we're only going to take the first, <laughs> we're only going to take five terms here, the first five terms, one, two, three, four, five. It's sort of like taking a tone and only using the first five harmonics of it. So then, here, here are the basis functions. These are the spherical harmonics. One of them is just light coming in from overall direction. One is light coming in in this direction. One is light coming in from this direction, and so forth, all the way around here. And it turns out we only need to use five of those. Those are the ones that will make a difference along the outer boundary or the occluded contour. And then, uh, if we have a patch here, one of those normal vectors here, we have these basis functions, and th these weighting numbers tell us how much of the overall light, how much from this direction, how much from the other. And we don't know what these numbers are. But if we use this basis and we measure it on lots of patterns on the outer boundary, we can then solve for this w, and we get five numbers. So there'll be five numbers for the boy. There'll be five numbers for the mother. And we have to say, are those the same? And that's all this says. I won't go through this. Anyway. Here's another painting by Garth Eric uh, that was done in this compositing method. He painted the background, and then nine months later, he went to the studio. He uh, kneeled down, and in a mirror, uh, he painted his self-portrait. So there's no guarantee that the lighting is going to be on the same on the background as on him. So we did that kind of analysis on the background here and on him. Here are our results. So on Apotheon, on this painting, here are those coefficients. If they're the same or very similar, it means that the lighting is the same on the boy and on the mother. Look at this, 0 0.42, 0 0.38, very close. Minus 0.22, minus 0.15, very close, and so forth. But on here, it's 0 0.14, 0 0.55, a factor of three, way off. Minus 0.03, minus 0.7, uh, minus 0.21, a factor of seven, way off. So this is showing that we can tell that the lighting is very different on the background and the foreground here, whereas they're very similar here, here. And it's very difficult for humans, even trained artists, trained connoisseurs, to do this by eye. And so we can now use this kind of technique in the Brad and Angelina type of um, case in paintings, even when the lighting is very complex, as it is uh, in uh, this kind of case. Now I'm going to use these techniques and more to address what was a big debate in the history of art uh, that started about a decade ago. When you stand back and look at the grand sweep of the development of Western painting, you find something very interesting it happened around 1430. Before that time, images were somewhat awkward and schematic. Look at this Giotto fresco portrait. Look at that ear, right? Or this anonymous Austrian portrait of a king, or Masolino's lovely porcelain doll-like portrait. But after that time, you get paintings like this. Our campaigns, a man, 1430. It looks so realistic, almost photographic. This portrait has a personality, an individuality, a psychological depth completely lacking in these early works. This guy looks like us. What happened? Well, in order to explain the emergence of this new art, or Ars Nova, as it was called, the celebrated contemporary painter and photographer and set designer David Hockney came up with a bold and very controversial theory. In a nutshell, he said those later paintings look optical because they are optical. But Renaissance painters secretly used optical devices during the execution of their works. Well, 
uh, the reaction of the scholarly and popular media was swift and shrill. Did the old masters cheat? Um, Hockneyed ideas, could the great artists even draw? Um, artistic fact or optical delusion? Secret knowledge, his book on the subject hits art world's optic nerve. And uh, there was a major symposium at the New York Institute for the Humanities to explore Hockney's ideas. And there were famous people there like you know, um, Susan Sontag and the director of the Getty, ex-director of the Getty Museum and famous painters like Chuck Close and Philip Goldstein. And they invited four scientists to uh, analyze his theory. Only two actually did, and I was one of them. And I have to say there was quite an intellectual tussle at that meeting, so much so that one article summarizing it was titled Smackdown. Now, it's not often that the state world of art history you appropriates the lexicon of the World Wrestling Federation. What the heck is going on? Well, um, here's Hockney demonstrating his mirror projecting technique. Here's Hockney in his studio in Santa Monica, very important. My home state, California, a lot of sunlight. Here's the subject outside and here's a window. And the key element in all of this uh, setup is this. It's a concave mirror, like a shaving or makeup mirror. It's in my hotel room I saw this afternoon. And anyone in optics can tell you that such a mirror can project an image just as does a lens. That image is on the other side of the wall here. It's upside down, real inverted. The artist would then trace it, according to Hockney, uh, and then turn it down around. And then while looking at the subject, they put in some shading. And if you wanted to paint over it, you would paint over in acrylic or oil, whatever is the medium of the time. So this is the technique Hockney believes was used to achieve this optical look in the Ars Nova. One of the paintings he adduces as evidence is this incredible masterpiece by George Lowe's work Price in the Carpenter's Studio in the Louvre. It's so realistic to Hockney that he believes that it was done using some sort of projection. But everyone knows, including Hockney, that a single candle does not produce enough light in a projector to, for it to be visible. Turns out, if you go through the mathematics, that the reduction in intensity is about a factor of 1,000. That's like putting on a pair of sunglasses, factor of 10, putting another pair of sunglasses over top of that, another factor of 10, putting another pair of sunglasses over top of that, another factor of 10, and then trying to paint by a single candlelight. You just can't do it. And Hockney admits this. So in his book, Secret Knowledge, he makes the following claim. Uh, in France, the most famous Caravaggio's followers is Georges Latour. Could that candle really produce all that light? Once again, the source of light seems to be outside the picture, as it must be to use optics. The source of light were in the setting, it would cause flare in the lens. Joseph and the girl, it's not a girl, it's Christ, were probably painted separately, each lit by a shielded light source in place of the other figure. So in his book, he shows two, I'll call them half paintings. He believes that when Christ was painted, the light source was in place of St. Joseph. And when St. Joseph was painted, the light source was in place of Christ. So you have to look at this and try and figure out where's the light source. Is it in place of uh, Christ or outside the frame, as Hockney also thought, or in place of the candle, the position Hockney explicitly rejects? Well, let's use some of the techniques that I've already shown you to answer this. We look for this clearest, most unambiguous cast shadow in the entire tableau. And that is the, cast, the shadow cast by the left thumb of St. Joseph onto the beam below. Here it is. You draw a line from it through the occluder, and bingo, it goes directly to the candle. Certainly not in place of Christ, and certainly not outside the frame of the painting. If you do a whole set of such cast shadows, you find indeed there's one, the fairly small lever arm, if you will, that's consistent. But the vast majority, including the cast shadow from the tip of his nose, meet right at the position of the candle. Now, I hope you can see there are these contours uh, surrounding these. These are contours of equal a posteriori probability density. It just says that given all this evidence, it's most likely that the light source is here, less likely here, less likely here, and less likely here. Like a high weather uh, region on a weather map. And uh, the way you calculate that is that the probability density of a given position based on all the uh, cast shadow evidence is just the product of the individual cast shadow evidences. Don't worry about the math, look at the picture. If one cast shadow says, you know, the light's coming along this direction, this angular ball up. The other one says, no, it's in this direction, with this ball up. The other says, this. What, this is the position that is most commensurate with all of those. 
most likely here, less likely here, less likely, not very likely over here, and so forth. So that's how I got those contours. 